about the 40 cents. Schillick even a back in for protection. The early 1980s were years of transition for the University of Alabama football program. Coach Paul Bear Bryant became college football's all-time winningest coach in 1981. A little more than a year later, he retired from coaching, placing the program in the hands of Ray Perkins. And soon after, Bryant passed away at the age of 69. Perkins' efforts to provide a seamless transition in Tuscaloosa coincided with the rise of Pat Dye and Bo Jackson at Auburn. Recruiting and on-field battles that had once been one-sided in Alabama's favor were now being vigorously contested. Perkins and his staff recruited aggressively against their cross-state rival, searching for players who'd help return Alabama to its rightful place atop college football. And though the blue chips would fall Alabama's way once again in the form of Cornelius Bennett, Bobby Humphrey, and Kurt Jarvis, Alabama's success in the 1980s would also come as a result of the efforts of less heralded players, players like a walk-on kicker from Red Bay named Van Tiffen. Red Bay, as far as the community is concerned, is a very good community. We have a, we have a church on every block. And some of the nicest people in the world live here in Red Bay. And it's a very, very good place for our family. It, uh, we have very little crime here in Red Bay. And Red Bay is not an old town. You know, it was started in 1907 when the railroad came through here. Red Bay is an outstanding town, uh, a population of about 3,500 people. The Tiffin family has been a well-known family in the area since 1907. And really prior to the town being incorporated in 1907. So the Tiffins family is a, a well-known family in Red Bay, Alabama. Basically born and raised here. Um, lived in one house the whole time. It's just about two blocks, three blocks maybe from the, from the uh, school here. Uh, we walked to and from school every day. You know, nobody worried about somebody picking up your kids. So your parents didn't mind letting you just walk to school. It's a whole lot easier than getting up and driving in getting you back and forth to baseball practice, football practice, so worked out really great. Enjoyed it. It was a very quiet, comfortable town, so it's not a bad way to grow up. Matter of fact, I, I can't think of a better way than the small town environment like this. The earliest I can remember playing anything was baseball. Of course, we played everything in the front yard. You know, it just depended on what time of year it was. If it was fall, we were playing football. You know, spring, we were playing baseball. Uh, you know, somewhere in between there we'd play basketball. And um, so that's just typical. And uh, my first memories here at this school was playing baseball. You know, we played uh, fast pitch baseball just up the, on the hill here. And then I remember playing uh, Pee Wee football out here. So we, st we started early. Well, he didn't have any idea about kicking when he first started playing football, so he decided that he would play, you know, some other position. So he played linebacker. And the 155-pound linebacker, you know, at any at any level, is not a is not a big linebacker. But you know, he was he could really tackle, and he was really quick. And so he he was a pretty good linebacker. Well, of course, he liked football, and you know, I don't know whether he had someone that he had, you know, seen on TV or an Alabama player or whatever. But uh, he he became interested in kicking. Somewhere around my ninth grade year, just messing around out here on the field, kicking around uh, before practice. Uh, I got kind of got interested in it, but you know I wasn't any good at it. It wasn't a natural thing. It wasn't a natural ability that I had. Uh, I just kind of enjoyed it. I, I can remember thinking back to um, varsity football games as a kid coming up. I always enjoyed watching watching the kickers warm up before the game and everything, and seeing the ball go as high as the lights. You know, I thought, wow, that's really incredible. How can anybody do that? You know, I don't know what happened, but um, I, I would even come up here some on the weekends, and I would walk up here with a couple of footballs and, and kick around. My dad got to noticing that, 
And uh, so one day he said, you, you know, are you interested in kicking, you know, learning how to kick? And I said, well, yeah, it'd be great. I'd like to know, you know, the fundamentals of it. I have no idea of what I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong. Kind of catching on to it a little bit, but not, you know, obviously any good at it. Well, the first contact I had with Van Tiffin was his dad came down here while he was in high school and wanted to know what the best thing to do is to teach Van how to uh, kick. And so I told him about a, a doc story that was an upcoming way, and that most people now kind of follow, and that's a, the soccer style type thing. It just so happened that around that time frame, uh, my brother or my dad won and picked up a Sports Illustrated. And there was an article in there on this guy named Doc Story, who was teaching kickers down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And uh, he had a couple of kids that were uh, kicking, and in, in, uh, well, one of them, as a matter of fact, was kicking at Alabama, it was Woody Humphrey. And he had uh, learned, had uh, trained under Doc Story. Oh, I said, Ben, you know, if you really want to go further with this, with this football business that you like so well, you're going, you need to make a kicker. I said, you can't do it, you know, in playing linebacker. And I said, this kicking coach that they mentioned here in the, uh, in the article is from Florida. And I said, I'll call him and we'll see if we can get you an appointment to go down there sometime and do some training. And he liked that idea. So my dad calls him up and asks him if he would be willing to teach me. And he said, yes, uh, you know, if, if Van's willing to work at it, he said, I will. If, he, if he's not willing to come down here and spend time on it, he said, I'm not interested. So I went out the end and bought Van 30 footballs. <laughs> and he started kicking, you know, before he went down there. Well, our spring break is always sometime in March, so I got Mickey Kennedy and Van's oldest brother, Tim, and, and a motorhome. And so they headed down to Fort Lauderdale for spring break with those footballs. And they went down there, and Doc Story taught Van about kicking. You know, that's all this man done was teach people how to kick, uh, either either punt, I mean, you know, both the kick or the extra points or the field goals or, or punt. And that guy wrote me a letter. No, he didn't. He called me on the phone. He said, uh, does Van play uh, any positions? And I said, yes, sir. He's a, he's a running back. And I outside linebacker and he said well you're going to be doing him an injustice if you have him do anything like that because he just needs to kick after van and mickey and tim got back from that first trip doc doc wrote me a note said van is the hardest worker i've ever seen and and he's got the potential uh, he's going to have to learn and sure enough when van came back he couldn't kick anything i mean he was of course but he knew the technique and so van dedicated himself for the next two and a half years as hard as anybody I've ever seen in kicking. Van kicked uh, six days a week. He took one day off. And uh, uh, any time, uh, most of the time, late in the afternoon, you could go by and he was down there kicking. Did he practice about two hours every afternoon? He quit playing anything he didn't think about. He didn't think about fishing. He didn't think about hunting. He just thought about kicking. And so he kicked every day. I did punt my junior year and my senior year. And then, so my first uh, field goal attempt was uh, my senior year. And it just took a long time for him to ever get so he could hit consistent, you know, punting or kicking field goals. I, I, I missed my first extra point I ever tried, uh, and that's the only one I ever missed. <laughs> it was in here, here at Red Bay. Field goals, I don't remember if I made the first field goal or not. Um, yeah, I only got to try four or five. It wasn't many. So I didn't have a whole lot of experience before I came to Alabama, really. If you think about it, just three or four kicks. Van didn't get good at kicking and place kicking until he had made 100,000 kicks. And, uh, you know, I did a little, you know, I could tell how many he was kicking every day, and I knew how many days he kicked and how many years he kicked. And when he got, when he got down there as a freshman in, in, uh, in college, he'd kicked about 100,000 times, and you could see him getting better all along. <laughs> But opportunities for kickers at the college level are scarce, particularly for one with little game experience. Still, Tiffin continued to work diligently at his newfound craft, and people began to take notice. When the word got out that he, that he was just dedicating himself to place kicking, which was sort of unheard of, really, in high school at that time. See, that was in, that was in 81 and 82. The college coaches started to come around his senior year. Well, they could tell he could really kick. You know, you could stand up there at the... Uh, at the field house and watch him kick and the balls were going a mile high and they were he, he wasn't anything uncommon for him to kick a 45 or a 50 yard field goal 
even his senior year in, in high school. Well, word got out my senior year that I had a little ability to kick. So uh, Southern Miss called me up, Tulane. They were the only ones that showed any interest, really. He made a commitment to, to the Southern Miss coach that he would come down there because they'd offered him a scholarship. And, of course, I, I didn't say much when we were talking to the coach. And so when we got through talking to him, I said, man, you know, I'd rather for you to go down to Alabama and walk on and not never kick a, a field goal or, or never punt than to go down there and take a scholarship at Southern Miss. I said, I, I could at least come watch you in that red uniform. And that was a great punter. Matter of fact, I think it was uh, when he graduated from high school, Blue Chip Magazine, I think, rated him one of the top three combination kickers in the nation. But then he, he uh, you know, went with just, uh, uh, you know, just uh, extra points in the field goals. I was recruited to punt, and I did both in high school. Um, that's what Southern Miss wanted me to do, uh, Tulane. That's what they were interested in. And Alabama at the time didn't need a punter. They had Malcolm Simmons. They had uh, Terry Sanders, which both were really good punters. Uh, and by the way, they both could wear me out punting. I mean, I wasn't even in the hunt with them. So, uh, but you know, the, the field goal position was wide open. And so my timing was absolutely perfect for that. Uh, they didn't have a proven field goal kicker. And then um, November, December uh, of 82, uh, I finally got a call from Coach Perkins and invited me to walk on. We had one of our coaches that was recruiting him <clears throat> comes into a recruit recruiting meeting one day and and uh, says we think we're going to get Van Tiffin to walk on and and I asked the question you know uh, what kind of kicker is he? he's a real good kicker so why don't we sign him to a scholarship you know <clears throat> this is my first year here and and they said well you don't sign kickers to scholarships we never have they have to earn it and I said okay if that's what we've always done let's let's do that. We went down as an official visit uh, after the first year, and it was cold weather. I remember we went down, and Coach Bryant had already turned in his resignation of, you know, being a coach. And so we went down there, and, and uh, we met Coach Perkins, and the next morning we were, go we were to meet Coach Bryant in his office at about 10 o'clock. So we went down there and, and went in his office and sat down. He had this long sofa, you know, that we sat on. Van sat on a chair right by Coach Bryan and, and my wife and I sat over there on that sofa and of course it was it didn't have a bottom in it. You just went right down to the floor nearly. And I got to meet Coach Bryant just about a month or so before he passed away. So that was a big thrill. And he he looked at Van and he looked around. He said, Well sometimes Mr. Tiffin they come in small packages, don't they? And I said, Yes sir. He said, you know, he said, you make those campers up there in Red Bay, don't you? And I said, Yeah. He said, I'm on he said, I'm gonna buy me one of those and go down to Legion Field this fall and I'm gonna eat fried chicken like everybody else. <laughs> you know, hey, we grew up Alabama fans. You know, if I thought there was a glimmer of hope, I, I was ready to come to Alabama. In the summer of nineteen eighty three, Tiffin joined the Alabama football team for fall practice. Not one to draw attention to himself, he instead focused his energy on becoming Alabama's starting field goal kicker. Van Tiff and I remember him being very small, and he never said a word. Um, but he was a good guy. We did run around together, but he, uh, like you know, we were talking before. I bet Van has never said more than five words at one time to me since I've known him, and, that, and I've known him since 1983. Very, very kept to himself. Very quiet, very quiet young man. Um, he was so quiet till you just didn't know he was in the room a lot of times. You know, he was one of them business-like guys where he came and, you know, kicked his field goals and went about his business. Well, I, I really didn't know Van. Uh, I don't know if any players know the kickers. I mean, they, they kind of like in the... They own little world at times, you know, they come out and they, they, they warm up and they practice. It just depends on when special teams is designed or when it's on the schedule. That's when you see them. I mean, obviously they work hard at what they do. When we would be working together, you felt part of the team, obviously. When you're doing the field goal drills and the punt, punt block, punt coverage, field goal, whatever. Uh, but, you know, the reality is 90% of the day, you know, everybody's going to be in their own groups doing their own things you know you got the the wide receivers in a group and you got the linebackers in a group and the the linemen and so you know everybody's broken up a good portion of the day and of course they all come together uh, most days to do 
you know, offense and defense. One thing Coach Bryant stressed is you don't coach the kicker because if he can't kick, he wouldn't be here. And so then what we did <clears throat> in coaching those people is that you have the timing, you know, the snap and the prescribed times that you have to get the ball back and the, the overall one point forward. And we, so you time a lot and watch a lot. But see, uh, the kicker has to develop and set his own style and get the things lined up. And so then that's why you, uh, that, that's why they're such an individual because no one really can help them. They have to do that on their own. I didn't think uh, uh, at that time we had anybody that was qualified to improve uh, the two kickers that we had, Van Tiffin and Chris Moore. So uh, Chris Moore being our punter, but uh, Van Tiffin was, uh, I interacted with him off the field, but not on the field that much. What you do is you leave kickers alone, let them focus on what they need to do, and you, you don't say much to them. Uh, being a former coach, you, know, you don't even send that to them when they get ready to kick the game with a field goal. Yeah, you know, he, he just said field goal and let them go out there and they're off to themselves. And he, he, whatever they do when they do it, they know what they're doing. And, and uh, I think you only say something to them when they miss, I guess. Van was one of those place kickers that never missed an extra point all through high school. So we knew, you know, what he brought to the table. And if we, what we wanted to do was, if we didn't score, was to just get into his range. He didn't back down from anything. But, you know, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of pressure on a kicker to have to go out there in front of the entire group and uh, be able to, he's going to win or lose the game. You couldn't bother him. Um, it just, uh, he was very calm and relaxed always. You know, we start practicing and then I, figure out real quick, you know, hey, you know, I can compete with these guys, you know, and that was kind of a surprise because you didn't know what to expect coming out of high school. And then the scrimmages came up, you know, a couple weeks prior to the first game, and I had good scrimmages, you know, I made, I think I made everything I tried in the scrimmages. So everything just kind of lined up there. And I can remember um, my 18th birthday, getting a call from Coach Perkins' secretary. And I'm thinking, what have I done? I can't think of anything that I that I might have done that I shouldn't have done or, you know, or I, I can't imagine what's going on here. So, you know, she calls me out and says, you need to be over here at the Coliseum in like 15 minutes. Of course, I was there in 15 seconds almost. Just prior to the season beginning, uh, I brought Van Tiffin uh, in the office and uh, let him know that he was, was going to be our kicker and that he was on scholarship. I think it was already, I may have already been in the bed when he called him. And anyway, he, he called me that evening and said, I'm going to be playing Saturday against George Tech, Daddy. <laughs> and so we went down to watch him play against George Tech. And the first thing I ever tried was an extra point. And that was in Legion Field against Georgia Tech. And, you know, early on we scored a touchdown. And I can remember walking out on the field and it just, you know, 70-some thousand people, you know, on a bowl around you, it just felt like pressure coming in on you. I, I looked over my shoulder, am I really supposed to be going out here? Uh, it was it was just such an odd feeling. But I made it, and then I tried a field goal a little later in the day, and it wasn't a real long field goal, something around 40 yards, and I missed it. So I missed my first field goal attempt. And I remember watching it sell to the right, just, you know, a couple feet. And I thought, that was really easy. I shouldn't have missed that. You know, I couldn't believe I missed it. Alabama would defeat Georgia Tech that day to start the Ray Perkins era on a positive note. The program had been infused with new energy. And though Coach Bryant's absence was especially painful that first season, the transition was off to a good start. Well, I, he did come in in a transition there. A, huge transition you know uh, and there's no way anybody could have you know been held in the same regard as coach Bryant we had uh, had something new happening and uh, to be part of that was uh, awesome and uh, the guys that were all come in and expected a lot from us he brought an NFL approach with a combined college you know way of teaching and you were required to do what you were asked to do and if you if you followed the guidelines and the rules and things that were set in place, you had no problem with Coach Perkins. If you were one of his players and you worked hard and you did what you were supposed to do, 
um, he would stand beside you through anything. Now, if you got on his bad side, um, that was not the place to be. He was kind of no nonsense type coach, but you could, you know, you could go into his office. He had open door policy. If he had a problem, you could go, you know, go to him. But uh, he, what I remember about him was was very business like. From him coming from, you know, the pros and coming to coach the college level, everything was first class, professional. Coach Perkins was a, a great players coach. I mean, he got, he was once there. He knows. He got along with the players great. He also stayed on uh, the group of receivers there more so than anybody, you know, because he was a, a receiver, so he wanted us to upstand that. You know, he, he is certainly a figure that uh, is very controversial. Either you love him or you hate him. There's no, there's no in between. The worst thing that happened to him happened when Coach Bryant died because then he was left to do his own thing. And uh, sometimes when you're in that situation, you, if you'd had hindsight, you'd be great. But we don't have that, unfortunately. So he removed the tower, and that upset some fans. And because, you know, now you, you're forgetting that Coach Bryant was ever even here. And there were several years prior to coming to Alabama as the coach uh, of being the guy that followed him. And uh, uh, don't ask me why. You know, a lot of people say, well, you're crazy, you know, to be, you know. It was just something I wanted to do. And uh, I can't, uh, can't add much more than that. And it was something that I got to do and had the honor to, uh, of doing it. And it was a great, great honor. I, I think he did an excellent job when he came in. He, you know, he built on it every year. And uh, by the time we were seniors, you know, we were at one point number two in the country. Had an excellent football team. Alabama finished its first season under Perkins 8-4 with a loss to Auburn and a win over SMU in the Sun Bowl. Van Tiffen cemented his role as the team's starting kicker, converting all extra points and 14 of 25 field goal attempts. But the wheels came off in 1984, the Crimson Tide struggling to a 5-6 record and its first losing season in 27 years. Alabama needed a fresh start in 1985 and got it in the season opener, a nationally televised night game against Georgia in Athens. Tiffin kicked field goals of 41 and 48 yards, but Alabama still found itself trailing by three with 50 seconds remaining and 71 yards to score. Mike Shula took the tie down the field in five plays, tossing the game winner to Al Bell with 15 seconds remaining. Alabama reeled off convincing wins the following three weeks against Texas A&M, Cincinnati, and Vanderbilt. Suddenly, the Crimson Tide was back in the national spotlight, undefeated with a trip to State College, Pennsylvania, up next. You just knew it was going to be your turn uh, from all the years before when the, you know, from the 78, 79, 80 teams and early 70 teams. And uh, you just knew you had a chance to win something is why you go to school at the university. So. You felt that that was going to be your year. Coming up on the schedule to play Penn State, both of us undefeated. And we came, we ran up against a team that was just more physical than, than we were. We, 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 we did what we, you know, came to do as far as a good game plan, but those guys were just too physical for us. Following the loss to Penn State, Alabama hoped to rebound against Tennessee the following week to keep its SEC record unblemished. The Vols had beaten the Crimson Tide three years running and boasted an offense led by Heisman candidate Tony Robinson. Points were scarce for both teams. Alabama's hopes coming down to a desperation field goal attempt. Game-winning attempt of 61 yards fell about a yard short. And uh, so that was really disappointing, although you know, probably wasn't expected to make it. Could I have made it? I think I could have, but uh, I didn't. Didn't have the distance that day. We just had to. We knew we was better than what our record was, and we we all dug down deep inside and and said, look, you know, we better than what our record are, and let's go get back on a winning track, and let's go ahead and win the rest of our games. Like I said, you think it's your year, and you have two losses back to back, and you're wondering if you're going to get right back on track, and looking for, you keep looking down the road to figure out what, who's going to be your next win. Um, and hopefully you're prepared enough to, to get to that point. But losing by two for two weeks in a row is uh, that's tough to swallow. Yeah, we still had something to play for, even though our 
goals came up short. We knew we probably was out of the national championship scene, but we were still seeking for the SEC title. Alabama put an end to its losing streak the following week. Shula tossed four touchdown passes, and the defense snatched five interceptions as the tide rolled over Memphis State 28-9. Alabama added to its SEC win total to cap off homecoming week. Tiffin scored 14 points, including field goals of 43 and 51 yards. Gene Jelks paced the offense with more than 100 yards rushing and receiving, the first Alabama player ever to do so. A 3-1 conference record, but the Crimson and tied on pace to compete for the conference title. A win over LSU and Baton Rouge would give Alabama the upper hand going into the Iron Bowl. Perkins' squad found itself in a fight for survival. A fourth quarter 68-yard drive gave Alabama just enough to tie the Tigers 14-all. That LSU game was probably my weakest point down there. The only time I thought that I was wondering about whether I could make a field goal or not, you know. She missed a couple, missed one the week before, and then missed those two. The last one I missed, pretty easy. Um, you know, and, and I'm a junior, I'm supposed to make those kind of kicks. It gets kind of concerning. I remember coming in after the game, and uh, LSU had really beat us beat us up that, that game. We felt we were pretty lucky to, to be where we were at that point. There was another group of guys that were also a lot, you know, a lot stronger than us, but you know, we had a lot of quickness, and we tried to use that to our advantage. Sometimes that, that, that falls short. So I'm kind of, you know, losing a little bit of confidence, and um, that's not good for a kicker to lose confidence. And I can remember the next game was against Southern Miss, and I go out to try a 48-yard field goal. I can remember kicking it. That's a long field goal. And I remember kicking it and looking up, and it's, cur and it's going out to the left. And I think it can't be. I, I couldn't have missed another one. Of course, then it curves right back in and make it. So I'm getting, I think, well, maybe I'm getting back on track. And that was the last game before the Auburn game. The record now stood at 7-2-1, and one, and no one needed a schedule to determine what came next. Always the two weeks before the Auburn game, Coach Perkins had a, a, you know, a unique way of just making it the biggest game of your life. He made, he made sure you understood it. Your average players are going to play good. Your great players are going to play better than they've ever played. It's like whatever you were as a or are as a player during the season, during that game, you're one notch better. Big ball game, and you, you want to go out and you want to play hard uh, to represent the state and, uh, and be, able to, be able to brag about that for the next you know, 365 days until it rolls around again the next year. You're playing against guys you went to high school with. You're playing against some guys who or well, in your neighborhood, you maybe even be playing against some relatives or your best friend. And after my freshman year, I knew what the Auburn game was all about. You didn't have to tell me anything. I understood the importance of that, of that football game. The impact before playing the game as a freshman, kind of brain locked. <laughs> Scared a little bit, and uh, I just didn't know what to expect. I really didn't realize how big of a rivalry it really is until you actually get to go and get to see it. And, get to be a part of it. But that game in 85 was tremendous because they still had Bo Jackson. And if you got Bo Jackson, you are a dangerous team. You know, Bo Jackson played that night, uh, had uh, 132 yards and played with two cracked ribs. And Pat Dye was there. And of course, Pat was an assistant coach at Alabama when I was there. And he's a, he's a tough guy, a good football coach. Characteristics of a Pat Dye coach team was they were well prepared. Uh, you know that you knew they were going to be well prepared. You knew it was going to be a dogfight uh, right down to the end. And almost all of our games were. If you go back and look, uh, we were uh, two and two against each other. Auburn had a really great team that year. Uh, I think they might have won the SEC championship or they had to beat us to win it. And they, uh, they were actually favored in the game. That day was no different than any other Auburn game. You know, everybody was really, really pumped up. And I can remember starting out the game, the game getting off to a good start. Both teams, you know, both sides of the ball made a lot of, a lot of big plays, both offensive and defensive. And, you know, we even had a chance to really jump on Auburn hard if we make, you know, if we put the ball in the end zone. 
we bog down and have to kick field goals. And the score, you know, the score just changed. Uh, you know, we went up and they went up, and then we'd go up and they'd go up. Going into the game, obviously, we didn't want to stop them, you know, dead in their tracks, but we knew we probably wasn't going to be able to do that and just kind of slow them down a little bit. Alabama jumped out to an early lead, driving 90-plus yards and 15 plays for the opening touchdown. Tiffin's extra point made it 7-0. John Hand sacked Pat Washington on the next series, causing a fumble. The Crimson Tide recovered at the Tiger 14, but had to settle for a 26-yard Tiffin field goal and a 10-0 lead. The Alabama defense stuffed Bo Jackson on the next series, and a 62-yard Greg Richardson punt return put the ball at the Tiger 13. But the offense stalled, and Tiffin came through. Through again from 32 yards out, 13-0 Alabama in the second quarter. But Auburn would get things going. A 47-yard pass play from Washington to Freddie Wagan set up a Jackson touchdown run. The Tigers cut the tied lead to 13-7. Alabama attempted one more drive. Shula found Bell in Auburn territory for a big game, but fourth down would lead to another Tiffin field goal. This one from 42 yards out. An Auburn field goal late in the second quarter would send the two teams to the half with Alabama leading 16-10. It was a dogfight. It, um, it, it, you know, it's one of those games where you never, you were never relaxed. Uh, no matter if we went ahead, it didn't really matter if we were seven points behind or seven points ahead. It was just like the score was zero zero because anything could happen. It was good uh, to have three field goals in a row to get your confidence up. So I was feeling really good at halftime. You can't, you can't go into halftime footing kind of down, you know, if you miss three field goals or even one, but uh, it was, it's good to go in with three under your belt. You had some uh, prolific players out there. I mean, Bo Jackson can turn the game around in a heartbeat. Um, Cornelius Bennett, you know, could, could just single-handedly change the course of a game. So you really had some great guys out there that could make things happen, and it was just a matter of time before it happens. You know, you knew it was going to happen, you just didn't know when. Neither team was able to score in the third quarter. Tiffin going wide left on a 52-yard attempt. Alabama mounted a solid drive to begin the fourth, but Shula was intercepted in the end zone on a deep pass to Richardson. The Tigers responded, driving 80 yards and sending Jackson over the top on fourth down. An Alabama penalty on the extra point gave Auburn a second chance on a miss, and the Tigers took the lead 17-16 with seven minutes left. The Tide offense took over at its own 11. A key third down conversion from Shula to Bell paved the way for a spectacular 74-yard run by Jelks. Alabama missed the two-point conversion attempt but held the lead 22-17. One of those games where neither team wanted to give up. It was a back and forth, back and forth, and nobody wanted to give up. They were basically controlling the ball that whole game. Uh, fortunately, our offense was doing a great job, too. It looked like it was going to be one of them games. You could see it just by being out and watching it on TV, whoever had the ball the last, that's who's going to win. Defensively, it was not a very good game at all, and probably it was our wax, well, not probably it was. It was our fault that we even got in that situation uh, because we just <clears throat> we just weren't doing very well against their offense. The Auburn offense picked up where it left off driving the length of the field. A late hit by Alabama gave the Tigers first and goal on the eight. Three plays later, Reggie Ware scored. Auburn missed the two-point attempt, but holding a 23-22 lead with only 57 seconds remaining. I don't know whether I thought deep down they were going to pull it off, but I did know and mentioned it that uh, on the first, in the first game of the year, they got the same situation in Athens, Georgia, with about a minute left to go, needed the touchdown and not a field goal. They had to have a touchdown. And Shula took him right down the field with passing to, Al to Bell and this kind of stuff, and he zipped right down the field. And with no time left, they beat Georgia. Deja vu of the first game. So that was one thing that uh, shown up gave us confidence, because we had been in that situation before. You know, we got the ball, we're behind by a score, and we're getting it with 57 seconds. So nobody was ruffled. You know, nobody was rough. We just said, hey, look, let's get in it, go down and score. So they had done it. And I, and I thought, well, it got, at least they got a chance. And they don't need a, a field goal to win it for them. 
They don't have to go all the way. And so there was hope there. But a man that's drowning will grab anything that floats by. And that's, and that's perhaps what I was doing. The tight offense took over on its own 20 in a situation that looked all too familiar to some. Things turned from bad to worse. Shula's first pass fell incomplete. On second down, he was sacked with 37 seconds left on the ball on the 12. Hope was beginning to fade. We had some players to make some really great plays to get us in position. We had to really, uh, uh, really claw our way down the field. You talk about a team effort. You know, we get the ball back. We've got, what, so many seconds left on the clock. Um, I think people forget, you know, what Shula did to drive down the field. I think they forget about what Greg Richardson did when he caught the pass and he drags the guy out of bounds just to get out of bounds. Being in a huddle that Mike Shula controls, uh, there's a calm. Uh, and there's a confident factor there that, you know, Mike is going to put us where he needs to put us into position and he's going to make the right check. Very calm. Very calm. You know, he just told us guys, look, we're in this together. Let's, let's go home. Let's execute. Let's go down and execute. On third and 18, Shula hit Jelks in the left flat for 14. Jelks worked his way to the sidelines to stop the clock at 29 seconds. Now I'm thinking, OK, not much hope. You know, something big's got to happen. So I'm standing on the, but you know, I'm up at the sideline. I'm thinking, I don't need to be back there warming up or anything. I need to be up here just in case something big happens really fast and in a hurry. That, that may have been the time, about the time the two guys on the sideline told me it's going to come down to you. You start thinking about all your practice, all your kicks, and then uh, you say, oh my God, Vans might have an opportunity to, to win it. You wouldn't believe how many times we re actually rehearsed beating Auburn in the last second of the field goal. I mean, we practiced it a million times. It was like we knew we was going to score. We knew we was going to score. We just didn't know how, but we knew we was going to score. Fourth and four, a desperate situation. With Auburn and everyone watching looking for the pass, the Alabama coaching staff opted for the unexpected. The greatest play was the little end around like the bell ran to move the chain, keep the, keep the ball alive. So everybody's looking for a sideline cut or something to get the ball out of bounds. And, uh, and Perkins sends in a reverse, Al Bell. Uh, but we ran, ran a reverse, and that was a call by Rocky Felker out of the press box. And Shula, a quarterback, make an outstanding, standing block. I mean, he leveled a guy out, just leveled him out, which, you know, enabled us to get out of bounds and stop the clock also. On first down, with 21 seconds left, Shula was almost picked off, looking for Richardson across the middle. With 15 seconds left, Shula worked through his progression before finding Richardson in the right flat, who dragged his defender out of bounds to stop the clock. Alder was in a combination coverage. They, were, they had man coverage on the, on the flankers, on the, on the wideouts, and they had a zone in the middle. And uh, everybody was looking again for him to throw the, you know, the long sideline cut or to get, you know, to get out of bounds. But it was one of them plays where they dropped back in deep coverage. And Shula dropped back and looked at his first option. And I guess his first option was the, looked at his self option. And I did a little 9 to 10 yard, little loop route, and just kind of you know, went across the middle. And was you know, taking my time because they were clearing out. And I'm just waiting, just waiting, just knowing I'm wide open, just saying, Shula, Shula, throw it to me. I said, just throw it, throw it. They drag Richardson across the middle. And, uh, and after he clears the, the man coverage, uh, Shula hit him across the middle. And then one of the defensive backs tackled me. And I kid you not, it feel like I drug him 10 yards, you know, with him holding on my waist, just trying to get out of bounds. And uh, I was able to get out of bounds, but I also <laughs> had a second option. I kept thinking, well, if he, if he tackled me, I gotta still try to throw it out of bounds some kind of way, you know, to make them not know it's a fumble so I can get, you know, keep the clock going. So it worked out perfect. 15 seconds to go, again from the 46. Bell in motion. Schiller keeping it back in for protection. Looks, set, 
Looking, looking, dumping, open, Richardson, head to the boundary, Greg. Head to the boundary, get out of bounds. He does, 35 yard line. Six seconds to go, let's bring on the field goal unit. Six seconds remaining, no timeouts. Auburn leading by one. Enter the former walk-on from Red Bay, the quiet young man who attempted his first field goal in a game only four years earlier. Bo Jackson, Cornelius Bennett, Mike Shula, the coaches, and a national television audience could only watch. I'm not going to stay here and say that, you know, you want to kick a last-minute field goal that's 52 yards. 25 or 30, yeah, we'd be ready all for that, but, you know, 52, that's not something that you really look forward to that you would want to to happen, but, you, you, you know, nobody wants it to come down to that. You know, they want to score a touchdown and everybody go in, but that's why you're there. That's why you're a kicker. You're there to make to make that tough kick. You know, you only get one shot and one shot only. This situation required a no huddle field goal. What we call a no huddle field goal. That means to go out there, line up, snap the ball and kick it. I mean, we didn't, didn't, have, didn't anybody have to call for it. I think it was quite obvious what we needed to do, you know, and our players knew it too. You know, we rush out on the field because we're not 100% sure he got out of bounds. Although if there's only six seconds, there would have been no way to set up for the field goal. But, you know, we wasted no time at all and uh, got out there just really, really fast. Didn't want to give anybody opportunity to do anything wrong, so we did a quick set and uh, band got ready. And then, uh, you know, you start thinking, am I going to be the one to, to miss it or... What are you going to do to celebrate after he makes? I mean, you, you think about all of it. Well, we rush out on the field, and, um, you know, we set up for the kick. Um, you know, at that time, I had a tee, lined the tee up. And I can remember looking back at the goal post, and it you know, went through my mind, you know, what was actually happening here, you know, what, how important the kick was. I was just counting to make sure there's 11 people out there we wouldn't have, and we wouldn't get a penalty. I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about him missing. I knew I, I, he put it right through the hub right. We had a lot of confidence in Van. We'd been around him now for three years, and it was almost automatic that if you can get Van pretty close, uh, you're not going to ice him. I mean, I used to laugh sometimes that <clears throat> when we'd come down and be to a field goal, the other team would call a timeout. <laughs> and I'd just go, you're wasting your timeout. I said, you're not going to ice that guy. Oh, I'm nervous, yeah. I, I'm, I'm nervous now. Not just not to the point I can't function or anything, but, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm thinking, wow, this is, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, this is the last play of the game. We're actually going to try a field goal here. I said, it's just like practice. And, uh, he, of course, he, he's over there and then kicking in the net, warming up. He could, I don't even think he probably saw maybe one or two plays of that drive. So that puts the ball at the 40-something, so it ends up being a 52-yard field goal. But what people don't realize, Ben Tiffin was kicking into about a five-mile-an-hour wind. It was a pretty good breeze blowing. And, uh, and that's what I was really worried about because I, I knew he had the leg, but I didn't know what the, you know, I just didn't know about the wind. So, you know, back on up, you know, look up once, once again at the goalpost. And I don't even really get set good, and I just out of the corner of my eye, I see the ball coming back there. And it really, it really shocked me because um, normally uh, the, the snapper didn't snap it that quick. He, he would, you know, the, he would at least allow the snapper put, the, put his hand down, look back at me, and then make sure I was ready. But, you know, I don't even think Larry ever even looked back at me. You know, and here comes the ball. So I was late leaving for the ball. And, but I went on ahead and kicked the ball. And, and uh, I could feel Kevin Porter, he's a defensive back, set up on the outside to, to try to block it. And I could feel him being there. And normally you didn't feel that. Uh, so there was two things that happened. Number one, I left late. Number two, he left early. He was off sides. I was late leaving the ball. So actually, he was on the ground when I kicked the ball. So had he things been a little bit timed a little bit differently, it would have probably at that point gotten blocked. There, there couldn't have been more than one or two seconds on the clock when Van hit the ball and it goes through the uprights and it was just uh, one of those beautiful things. It was a good snap, perfect, good hold, Van perfect kick. Felt like I hit it good and I can just remember looking up at the goal post and seeing it go down the middle and at that point I thought, I can't believe it. This is unbelievable. 
you know, this is going to make it. Because, you know, you can tell it takes it two or three seconds to get there that far away. It was just incredible to see, to look down the, and see it going right down the middle and understanding that that was going to be three points, that that was going to be the end of the game. So it's going to be about a 52-yard attempt. The 52-yard attempt will be it for Van Tippett. This would win the game. A 52-yard try. The clock will not start for the ball is snapped. There is the snap, the kick. It is in the air. It has this it. It's good! It's good! It's good! It's good! It's good! It's good! Van Tippett has won the ball game. Paul Kennedy and I were broadcasting the game, and so we lost control and and enjoyed it. So it was it was a great victory. It really was. Doug Layton and. Uh... Paul Kennedy, Paul was doing the play-by-play, -play and, and uh, Doug was doing the color, and Paul Kennedy said, it's good. And then Doug Layton said, it's good. <laughs> and then Paul Kennedy said, it's good. <laughs> they kept on saying, it's good, it's good. <laughs> and finally, Doug, Doug said, Alabama wins. <laughs> Things like that just happened. Nobody plotted it, planned it, because we had no idea how the game was going to end. And then when he said, it's good, I just said, it's good. And he looked at me and said, and so we said it a few times, Later, it turns out it galled all the Auburn people. They thought we were rubbing it in and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, yeah, we probably were <laughs> a little bit, but it was all in fun. Halfway there, you knew it. And I uh, just turned around, and both of us would start looking at each other, and that was it. And uh, I mean, he was unemotional. I mean, I don't think he got very excited about it until everybody hit us on the sideline. The only thing that comes to mind is running to the middle of the field after he kicked the field goal and trying to hold him up in the air like everybody else was and, and telling him and then saying, I love you. I love you, Van Tiffin. You know, that was a great moment. I was one of the first one out there on the field slapping Van Tiffin across the head and high-fiving. I mean, it was almost like the weight of the world came off your shoulders because you know, at that particular point in time, you know, it, it didn't look like we had a chance of winning the ball game. I remember Chris Moore and Mike Shula being the first ones to us, and uh, man, it was uh, deafening. I'm kind of shy. I'm not real, you know, uh, outward personality and everything, and I'm just not, it kind of, it was kind of shocking to see everybody make such a big fuss over it. I was ready to go back in the locker room, let's go home, you know, and uh, everybody wanted to stay around a while uh, and enjoy it. Everybody goes crazy, crazy. I mean, it was pr T-shirts printed up with the scores, hats and everything, I mean, with a matter of seconds. The whole big celebration that went on, I didn't see it until the next day because I just turned and walked to the locker room, you know. And now looking back, I wish I would have just, because nobody remembers that we played so bad. I wish I'd have been out there jumping around, hooping and hollering. But at the time, I was just going, hey, we, we, we dodged a bullet. Tippett. This would win the game. A 52 yard try. The clock will not start for the ball is snapped. There is the snap. The kick. It is in the air. It has missed it. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Van Tippett has won the ball game. Alabama has beaten Auburn. Van Tippett has kicked a 52 yard Oh, at that time, it meant uh, so much. It's incredible because you can ask Alabama or Auburn fans, would you rather have an undefeated year or something like that or, or lose one game to Auburn or lose one to Alabama? They're going to usually choose to, to win over their opponent. No, I didn't realize at that time this would be something we'd be sitting out here at Red Bay High School 21 years later talking about it. I had no idea. You know, I knew it was a big kick. I knew, you know, it was a big deal, but... I didn't realize that people would remember it, and that's what they would remember me for. He had taken a team that went, what, five and six a year before, and then, to, and then to this, where he had finally got some players, and he had finally instilled in us, no matter what the score is, you're never out of it. Uh, it's the best one I played or coached in. You know, it, it's, the, it, it's the best because it was a seesaw back and forth. You never knew who was going to who was going to win, you know. Uh, uh, there was never that much difference in the score throughout the game. To be part of that history, 
Everybody always talk about the tradition and the history, and it was fun. It was real fun, and you know, it was a lot of experiences that, you know, a lot of people just, they can't feel. You know, and I'll always keep those memories and cherish those memories with some of the guys that I played with. Well, the thing I treasure the most is what it means to the Alabama people. You know, to go back to the to the stadium and see it played at times and just see how excited people get and what it meant to the the fans and, and everything because uh, you know I had a something I did something special that day or had it played a part in something special that day that meant a whole lot to them. Ryan! 